Hello everyone, I am here with Semelis Lopez, who's running in New York's 15th Congressional District, and she is here to talk about her campaign. Semelis, thank you so much for coming on the program. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So if you can't tell, she is in the heart of Bronx currently. Tell us where you are. I'm in the heart of the South Bronx right now. I'm by 3rd Avenue and 149th, which is the hub in the Bronx. That's awesome. You can like you can hear the drums in the background. It like you you really get a sense of like the spirit in the city and it's so exciting. Now, one thing that's right. interesting is that you it's a are a beautiful community. I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm talking to a lot of people from the Bronx. Um, I've interviewed candidates from the Bronx, one of which is uh, AOC. You are running in her neighboring district and you basically just recently got one of the biggest endorsements, if not the biggest endorsement that you can get in politics. AOC. So tell us about that. How did you get the endorsement of AOC? Well, you know, AOC's Courage to Change PAC endorsed our campaign as of last Friday, and they'd been uh, reaching out to us and they wanted to find out how we were organizing our volunteer network, because that's really what people like AOC care about. They don't care about how much money you have in the bank. They don't care, uh, you know, how much money you have. For her, it's a matter of building a political movement of figuring out how many volunteers you have, the excitement that you have on the ground. Um, and I think that she went with us because of that, because she saw how we were fundraising our money. Over 80% of our donations are small dollar contributions from the Bronx um, and from New York City as a whole, unlike any other candidate um, and campaign that's running in the 15th Congressional District. I think that our fundraising reflects our values in the community. Right now, the community is going through a gentrification and a displacement crisis in the community, so we cannot afford to send people to Washington or any level of government that is taking real estate developer money, corporate PAC contributions, pharmaceutical money, basically taking donations from systems of oppression that are bringing us down in the community. So I think that they saw that in our campaign and, you know, they went on board to support our efforts so that we can uh, grow, so that they can help amplify what we're doing on the ground with resources so that we can develop the kind of infrastructure that we need to win this race. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I hope that she makes more endorsements because I think that she really does have a lot of influence. And it's nice to see that she's not yeah. like getting to Congress and closing the door behind her. She's trying to bring more people in. I will say I'm a little bit bitter that she didn't endorse my girl, Sema Hernandez in Texas. But with that being said, she has a lot of great people. And I would encourage you all to check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, So you mentioned the, the real estate developers and anyone who's a progressive from New York, they always talk about that because this is the key to a lot of the issues there. And what's interesting about you is that you were actually a congressional aide for your current opponent. So tell us who your opponent is and why, you know, as someone with a little bit of inside information, you think that you'd be a better representative for that district. Well, actually, I'm not running against the person that I was a congressional aide for. Uh, this is an open seat. Oh, okay. So Congressman Jose Esterrano is uh, retiring because uh, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So he's stepping down. So on June 23rd, 2020, there's going to be an open seat here in the South Bronx to determine who the next congressional candidate is going to be that's going to represent the neighborhood. So uh, he's actually really beloved in the congressional district. He's been here for like 30 years. He's actually really progressive on uh, many issues. Uh, so he's going to be stepping down. So he gave me my first opportunity of public service as a congressional aide, doing housing casework and immigration casework. And I saw the way that he was able to lead in the community and how he was able to bring many different people together. Because even though this is a, a predominantly Latino community, it's not just Latino, it's West African. It's African American, it's Yemeni, it's Muslim. Uh, it's, you know, a slice of every piece of the world is in this community. So the representative that deserves to win this area and represent it is somebody who's not going to play identity politics, is somebody who's going to basically bring people together so that we can realize what we have in common, which is fighting against things like white supremacy, fighting against things like worker exploitation, immigration injustice, and being a champion for the Homes Guarantee platform, which is a platform that that's beautiful that was basically created by directly impacted people facing homelessness and lack of repairs in their homes and, and mold living in NYCHA and things like that and they all came together to say this is not how we want to live and we want to reclaim the housing stock and we want to bring this platform together and be a champion of it uh, so that people in the community can live with pride and dignity 
Um, so that's kind of like what the issues are in this congressional district. The number one issue that we hear at the doors is homelessness. It's the rents skyrocketing. So we need a working class champion that's going to reject that kind of money, real estate developer money to finance their campaign and put the people first unapologetically. And that's what our campaign is about. That's actually really encouraging um, because I see a lot of situations that are basically David versus Goliath across the country. So to know that you're not like taking on a political machine, I mean, you still are in a sense, the establishment, but you're not going up against an incumbent. That actually really is encouraging. So I, I kind of want to ask you about the dynamics of the race because I wasn't aware that he was retiring. Um, what has it been like? Like, are you basically receiving the blessing of him and the establishment in New York City, like the local establishment? Or is this basically a really no, competitive no, no, race? No, I, I don't know how he's, even though he gave me my first start of public service, this was years ago when I graduated college. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where he's standing or he's supporting. He hasn't been vocal on that. But, you know, I'm not waiting for anybody's blessing. Uh, I basically am doing this with the blessing of the community and people that I have been organizing with for a very long time. I believe that when, you know, you have a calling to do something like this, you have to basically rely on the community and you have to create that change. And it starts from the ground up, really. So I don't think that we need to ask anybody for permission. And, you know, the last people that I would ask permission to do anything like this is the Bronx Democratic Political Establishment. So we're moving forward. We're organizing, we're knocking on doors, we're raising money in a clean way that centers the needs of directly impacted people in the district that I love. And that's basically who's inspiring us to keep going when things get hard. Um, and we're basically leading with love and compassion, which is revolutionary in and of itself, and really using politics as a way of building community and bringing different people together and being humble in terms of how we approach people so that we can listen to their needs and let their needs as directly impacted people living in this community shape our platform. So we've been taking people's opinions and perspectives so that we can build out what we're fighting for because I have a background in urban planning and I believe strongly that we need to center those experiences because a lot of people talk about very um, fancy terms in policy, and sometimes policy is done from an ivory tower, but I'm against that. I think that it's directly impacted people that need to shape policy and the narrative. And, uh, you know, we need people in all levels of government that reflect those direct experiences. And that's basically the perspective that we're taking in our campaign. Yeah, and I love that so much. I love that so many candidates, yourself included, like you're not yes. waiting your turn, for lack of a better word, where, you know, you have to go through- Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, you kind of like... Did I cut off? for a second. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, perfect. But you're back now. Yeah, so, okay, what I was saying was, I really like that candidates such as yourself, you're not... Uh, waiting your term, uh, for lack of a better word, because it's like you don't, no, absolutely not. you're not going through all of these proper channels. Like you're just standing up because you have experience with the community and just browsing through your Twitter feed. Like I, I just thought to myself, she's phenomenal. I love you. You were talking about how oh, it so only rich people can attend the debate. You were tweeting about that with the ticket cost of seventeen hundred dollars right. in South Carolina, and it's it's so infuriating because it really feels like normal working people have just been shut out of our entire political process. And so to see candidates like you rise up, it really is inspirational, even though that sounds corny, like it, it is true. So can you talk through your platform a little bit because you have a very uh, human-centered approach to politics. What's your platform? Right, uh, the platform that we're fighting for is definitely um, everything that we were talking about. We want to have people have a sense of true ownership over the local political process. Well, before I announced my participation in this race, we've been organizing people on the ground in terms of educating them about the infrastructure of their local political party and getting them enrolled in local party positions like county committee, district leader, state committee. Um, basically what Bernie Sanders was inspiring us to do back in 2016. He said that we should be running in all levels of politics and government so that we can transform our government and make sure that we've been organizing for a very long time in the community uh, democratizing political information and identifying activists that have been doing this work on the ground and taking guidance and inspiration from frontline communities here in the Bronx, like the environmental justice community that has bared the brunt of environmental injustice. So we need to center that narrative and inject it in everything that we do and use our platform in Congress to 
fight for those ideals and center that these experiences and that platform so that we can take the advocacy to the next level and create the right political conditions for the community activism and the movements on the ground that are really the ones that are have a huge role in making transformative change in the community. Um, we need to create the right political conditions for that activism on the ground to take root. And um, what happened in 2018 with the Independent Democratic Conference, I don't know if you follow that conversation in New York State, but it was uh, me like eight uh, rogue Democrats that were empowering Republicans in Albany to stay in power. And then everybody in the progressive space, the authentic grassroots real you know, progressive space here in New York City and in the Bronx, we all got together to defeat that arrangement. And because of that, we were able to see one of the most progressive tenant rent reform measures that have ever been passed in Albany and all of New York State, New York State's history. And it's because the new people that we stood behind, the grassroots politicians that we ended up putting in Albany through our grassroots community effort, were able to amplify the housing justice movement on the ground that directly impacted people have been clamoring for for decades. And because of those political conditions that were created that was able to, to take root and give us tenant rent protections here in New York State. So the same thing has to happen nationally. We need to you know, look at what's happening in New York State with uh, the tenant rent reform uh, laws, with the efforts around the homes guarantee, seeing that energy and the housing activists that got together to make this happen. We need to be amplifying that at the federal level as well. Yeah, your platform is very robust. So I would encourage everyone to look um, at her platform. We'll have a link on the screen. I wanted to ask you because um, a day after the debate in South Carolina, there was an open letter from people of color in New York who basically called on the people of South Carolina and individuals voting on Super Tuesday not to support 2020 presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg. And since you're from New York, I wanted to get your take on Mike Bloomberg and the way he's trying to basically buy this election. Oh, my God. We need to stand against any efforts to buy our democracy. One of the biggest things that I'm fighting for is the importance of taking away big money and politics, because like we've been talking about the whole time, that you know affects everything that we're fighting for in the community. And it's a direct assault on our democratic values. So it's actually really corrupt what's happening with this election. But I'm not scared of Michael Bloomberg because in the door knocking that I've been doing in the Bronx, people overwhelmingly love Bernie Sanders and they understand that he's the working class champion that the people need and they love his message. And people love his message around worker solidarity, around the union movement. Uh, he came out with a great platform the other day on universal child care, uh, you know, that people really need, at least in my community, because a lot of people leave their kids home when they go to work because they can't afford childcare. So people understand who the true working class champion is and the importance of making sure that working class people that are making under $40,000 a year, $20,000 a year, have a champion, an organizer in chief that's going to fight for their values and their needs and you know what they're about so that we can rise together as a community and respect the revolutionary legacy that places like the Bronx you know, can, you know, show to the world because this is who we are. I'm standing on the shoulders of a movement and people like Michael Bloomberg don't represent that. But people like Bernie Sanders and AOC and then Omar and the rest of the members of the squad represent that transformative change. So this race in particular, for me, I keep saying this on the, camp tra on the campaign trail, it's about leaving behind the transactional politics of a broken political system and embracing the politics of transformation that's being waged in Washington, D.C. right now by people like Bernie Sanders, AOC, Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, uh, and others that are engaging in uh, the fight for transformative justice in the country, in our communities. And that's the kind of transformative transformation that we need to see, that we need to to fight for because this is really about reclaiming the soul of the Democratic Party and reclaiming our working class roots in this party that have been co-opted by the corporate Democrats that are not cor even corporate Democrats, they're Republican light. So we need to reclaim our working class roots in this party and take it over. Yeah. And that means getting more numbers, getting more people like AOC and Ilan Omar into Congress 
uh, so that we can build that infrastructure and make sure that this party works for the 99%, not the 1%. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you used the term organizer in chief, because to beat money, that's the only way that we're going to even have a chance. And you really see the power in grassroots organizing. I mean, uh, all across the country, from the Bronx to uh, Seattle with socialist Shama Sawan organizing and beating Amazon, like this really is a national movement and it's yeah. so nice to see so many people rise up so i know that you've got limited time before you go tell us what we can do to help you get elected well i'm so grateful for this platform that you all have given up given us um i think raising awareness donating is also a very important piece of that you can go to lopez for the people.com because since we've restricted dirty money to finance our campaign we're just relying on regular grassroots contributions from the community to keep us afloat, to feed our volunteers, to distribute our literature. So that's an important piece. Uh, you know, share us on social media uh, and connect with us too. If there's an idea that you have, if there's something on the platform that you feel could be expanded, uh, sign up at lopezforthepeople.com. If you have a talent in video making, definitely sign up and connect us to people. Uh, you know, we're always looking to, to learn and build in our own community because we always want to center the frontline experiences of people in, in the Bronx, because that's one of the things uh, the Bronx keeps getting described as the poorest congressional district in the entire country. And that's something that I want to get across uh, tonight before I uh, hop off. Uh, it's not just the poorest congressional district in the country. We have a lot of economic challenges, but it's the most resilient borough in the entire country because we've you know seen in the 70s and the 80s how the landlords burned the buildings here for profit um, and then we saw the incredible rebirth of the South Bronx and you know what that meant so I definitely am standing on top of a I'm a movement that has always been here in the Bronx. I'm standing on our revolutionary spirit, our resiliency. And I think that there's a lot of local solutions here in the South Bronx, this congressional district that can be implemented nationally and globally. So I feel that with this race, one of the things that I wanna do along with others collectively in this community is transform the way that the Bronx is perceived in the world. We're not downtrodden. We're a place of rebirth. We're the birthplace of hip hop. We, you know, are the birthplace of, of salsa. You know, uh, we have a lot of creativity and energy and people need to be looking to the South Bronx as a global and a national policy thought leader. Um, you know, where the solutions that the frontline communities here have developed can be implemented internationally and nationally. That's perfect. Thank you so much. So for follow us at lopezforthepeople.com. Come to the Bronx, help us knock on doors, help us, uh, you know, volunteer. And uh, thank you so much. Yes. Before we go, best place to eat in South yeah. Bronx. Well, I'm near one of my favorite places. It's La Bella. It's a Mexican restaurant that's by 149th and Morris Avenue. They have really good chicken quesadillas and I get them with extra cilantro and uh, onions and uh, cheese on top. And it's really good. Now I'm hungry. Thank it's you. It's called La Perla. <laughs> well, there you have it. Thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been an absolute Thank pleasure. You. We will be following your campaign very closely, yeah. and good luck. Thank you so much. And remember, uh, visit us at lopezforthepeople.com.